Katrine Arafai is an essayist and playwright based in Berkeley, California, whose creative nonfiction has appeared in Free Slate Review, Meat for Tea, The Valley Review, and Water Stone Review, and was received with acclaim at numerous literary events in California, including Action Fiction in San Francisco and Rorschach in Los Angeles. Her play The Elba Snopsers was selected by the Midtown International Theater Festival of New York City for production in the Fall 2016 Festival and reached the semifinalist round of the Ivoryton, Connecticut Playhouse's inaugural Women Playwrights Initiative later that year. In 2018, the play was selected for production during the Iranian Drama Festival, which is held annually in Heidelberg, Germany, and was also performed at Central Stage in Richmond, California in the spring of 2019. Katrine's latest theatrical work is the trilogy Peace, A Massacre, and the Umbrella, which premiered at Plaxel Gallery in New York City in June of 2019. Katrine has a master's degree in piano performance and pedagogy from the Nassin Academy of Music in Moscow, Russia. When she is not writing, she is busy at Golden Key Piano School in Berkeley, where she is the artistic director and head teacher. You can find out more about Katrine at goldenkeypianoschool.com or on Instagram at Katrine underscore RFI. For this reading of The Dog and the Shoe and the Window, the role of first character, a person, is played by Dan Capalbo Jr. The role of second character, a person, is played by Peyton Bristol, with Larry Wrinkle reading stage directions and cues. Dog and the Shoe and the Window, the play in one act by Katrina Arafay. Cast of characters, first character, a person, second character, a person. Scene, a room. Time, the present. Act one, scene one, setting. An image of a window with view of mountain painted on cardboard hangs on the wall stage right. A vase sits on a small side table placed downstage in the center. Long shadow of the vase made out of paper is placed on the floor. The rise, no one is in the room. First character walks in, stares at the audience stretches his arms wide and yawns, looks around and notices the long shadow of a small vase on the floor, tries to move the shadow by kicking it with his leg, doesn't succeed, then looks through the window and notices the view of the mountain, ponders, takes the window off the wall and hangs the window on the other wall center stage upstage, then stares at the mountain again, Satisfied, stretches his arms wide and yawns again. Notices that now the window is on the other wall. The shadow should be on the other side of the vase. Moves the shadow, looks at it, and is totally happy with the result. Second character walks in, puts a folded newsletter on the table next to the vase, Walk stage right towards where the window used to be yawning and stretching. Notices the window is not there. Oh my God. You like it? Of course not. Of course not. It, it, it was there. All this time it was there. That is right. It was there. And now it's not. That is right. Not there anymore. No, you can't. I can't. You can't move something that was always in one place to a place that it wasn't always there. I wanted to look at it from this angle. Look at what? The view. The mountain? Yes, and see if there is anything else there. What do you mean anything else there? It has always been there all these years, even before all these years. How is Mimi? Mimi had a surgery. Two. Mimi had two surgeries. Yes. At first she had one surgery, but then she had another surgery. So as of now, she has had two surgeries. That's a lot of surgeries. I think so. No, this is incomprehensible. I grew up with the shadow being stretched out to the west side in the morning and the mountain being at the east side. You can always adjust the shadow. Look. Did you call me this morning? I called yesterday morning. How was she? Better. But two is a lot. Let me show you how it works. You see? 
This is what I mean. Wait, but this is not how it was when I walked in. Doesn't matter. But ever since I started living here, the window has been always there. Uh, oh, the shadow. Much better. Yes. Yes. Of, of, of course. Yes, of course, of course. All right, today I will call Mimi. Yes, you will. You think so? But wait, the mountain. Yes, the mountain. Didn't you say the mountain must be on the west side all these years and even after all these years? Before. What? I said before, not after. Yes. I would have never said after. Yes, before. Because. I understand. But you said west. You said west. West. Did I? You did. I wouldn't say that. Why wouldn't you? Because I'm not that kind of character for whom these kinds of things makes a difference. At least in this play, I'm not. What kinds of things? Sides, east side, west side. Why is it that I can't move the window, but you can move the mountain? Move the mountain? Double standards. No, no, no. Yes, yes, yes. I am not moving the mountain, God forbid. You are. <laughs> For me, no matter where the window is placed, I see the same view, view of the mountain, because I, I grew up seeing the view of the mountain through the window. So. What? So if we put three windows, you would see a mountain in every single one? Always. And all three would look exactly the same, the same mountain. All three. And that is because... That is because I grew up seeing the same mountain, stupid. I am sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I lost my patience. I understand. Can I tell you what the view of our window was in our living room where I grew up? Oh, you had a window? Yes. You had a window in your living room? Yes. I didn't even know you had a living room. Oh, yes, we did. You never told me about that. Well, I thought it was self-explanatory. Meaning? Because all those who live have a living room. All those who live. So are you implying that you used to live? Yes. You mean before we met? I did. <laughs> I feel like I'm only getting to know you. Maybe I should have explained. I didn't think it was necessary. No, no, that's okay. And in our living room. Aha. Uh -huh. We had a window. Yes, you had mentioned that just a second ago. And the view from our window. Gosh. This is hard to comprehend. Do you think now is the right time to talk about this early in the morning? I mean, I need my coffee before I can talk about all of this and gosh. You are right. You need your coffee. Go make your coffee. Of course I will. Yes, of course. And then I will call Mimi. Second character exit stage right. At the same time, first character exit stage left. They have both immediately re-entered from where each exited. Second character is holding two cups of coffee in his or her hands. First character is dragging a wooden chair in one hand and holds a conventional landline telephone in the other hand. The phone's cord is dragging on the floor. They walk quickly towards the table and set the chair and put the phone and coffee cups on the table without plugging in the phone. Second character picks up the phone and dials three digits, sits on the chair. First character, standing near the table, starts drinking coffee while watching second character and listening to the second character's phone conversation. Mimi? Mimi? 
hi, it's me. I'm, I'm just calling to say hi. Call me when you have a chance, okay? Okay? He, puts the, he, he or she puts the receiver down and starts drinking coffee. Phone rings right away. Second Carrick picks up the phone. Mimi? Hello, Mimi? Hi. Hi, my dear. Nice to hear your voice. So nice. I, I am fine. We are fine. It's, it's just the dog. Oh, oh, the dog. The animal just chews everything up. I bought these very pricey shoes. An average worker has to work three weeks to make the money I spent on these shoes. Famous brand, you know? And now I have to sew them up. The dog has eaten so many electronics already. All the expensive ones, you know? All the pricey brand names, you know? It's just the dog that you don't know. It, it, it's new to us too. We don't know why we got a dog. You know what? You should come and visit. Let's plan a visit, okay? Yeah, I will. I will. Every, everyone says hi to you, too. Bye now. So? What? Is she feeling better? I, I told her about the dog. Of course you did. You think so? End of scene. Katrine, I was crying laughing during part of that. I was, I, it was uncontrollable. <laughs> I mean, part of it might be that I'm so, like I'm accustomed to your absurd <laughs> writing, but I, I was just, I, that's all I'm gonna say. It was, I thought it was Thank funny. you, that was very fun reading. Thank you both, all three of you. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. And mm -hmm. thank you, Isaac. Yeah, you both had a, you, you established a, a good, strong, I mean, for this type of reading, you established a good, strong <laughs> rapport somehow. Is it like a natural chemistry with your, I, th I guess you just both kind of sunk into the characters as best <laughs> as you could, and it worked. Yeah, it was interesting. I didn't know what, what I was, where it was going, but, uh, you know. Is this part of a longer work? That's a good question. It, it's a 10-minute play. But I am, I am uh, expanding the idea. I don't know if all of it will be part, but the idea is expanding. Uh, you know, I, I, I love the um, ingenuity of the, of the mountain and the shadow and the window uh, ideas. Um, I'm a little less clear about where Mimi and the dog fit in, or is that just intended to be part of the absurdity? in a sort of a, um, a Dadaistic or a Madrid sense. Um, should I answer that? Okay. Yes, yes. Yeah, I think there are two, two subjects in this very short play. One is dogmatism and the other one is disconnection. Mm -hmm. So it shows the disconnection, even though they, they care about Mimi, but they cannot show that or so. Maybe too short of a play well, for, for two big subjects. I kind of, I, I would. I kind of felt that when I was trying to talk to her, like that yeah. I didn't have that ability to really say any, you know, I would rather have had her call her instead of me. And when I actually did have the connection, I didn't have anything to say. So I used the dog, you know, at least that's how I felt when I got, I didn't know what lines were gonna come next. So I was just flipping through my phone, but I realized, yeah, well, I didn't know what to say. So I brought up the dog, you know, or at least that's how I felt. Yeah, exactly. do, we, do we know who Mimi is or do we need to? I don't think we need to know who Mimi is. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I will share that um, the experience of doing Peace, the Massacre, and the Umbrella, as well as all the other things I said about it, um, there were two actors, fine actors, that were involved that were virtually ripping their hair out every single rehearsal because they had never tried to do something absurd. And so they're, wait, well, well, what am I supposed to do here? You, like, you don't, just do it, just do it. Like, yeah, but that doesn't make any sense. Like, That's the point. Right. 
<laughs> you know, like, but it does, it, it does, if you allow it to not make sense, it makes sense. It, like, it was just, they, they really struggled with that, but they did fantastic in it. That's what the thing is. But the other thing is, I, I'm noticing, Katrine, that you, um, like, I'm guilty of everything relates to everything to me because I see life as one big, like, mass of cookie dough and we get to pick whatever, you know, chunk we want at a time from that. But um, I think you're similar. You, you probably handle things similarly because initially you wrote the Elvis Knopsers, which later got, got, became part of a three piece that became one piece. And now you're saying this is part of something else that might be bigger. Um, yeah, am I right about that? Yes, yes. Yeah, uh, if there, anybody else has any other thoughts, even if you've not talked yet, if you're on mute right now, feel free to chime in, Joe Mac. Yeah, uh, Katrina, I really, really like this. Um, I'm a huge fan of like Waiting for Godot and the whole absurdist thing. So I was down with it. Um, I yeah, just kept thinking about, uh, you know, Didi and Gogo, two characters, you don't know where they are. They're waiting for something, you know what I mean? Uh, whether it's for the people to call or to communicate with the outside world, you don't know if they're alive. Um, my favorite line was, I don't know exactly what it was, it was like something about moving the mountain and just like, you're just going to move that. You can just move mountains. Great line. Um, I loved, um, yeah, like that, that beginning scene that uh, Larry was saying, uh, just about setting the scene, the fact that this, he's moving, uh, the, sorry, character one or it's character one, right? First character is moving the shadow and moving the, um, the, 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 the window. I mean, that just sets the scene. You just know what kind of play this is going to be. And you know that it's um, anyway it's just really really clear and they just really really strong. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I enjoyed I, I enjoyed I, the sparring between the the two characters about the window, which was just a piece of cardboard with a mountain, and how <laughs> how static the one character was about where it had to be. You know, it was always there, always. <laughs> that was fun. Yeah, the, the pantomime is really works well with them. I mean, I, I've read absurdist work, but I think there's an original um, element here in the way you're handling those um, say, set pieces that I haven't um, or often seen or can remember seeing. And I like the way you write the stage directions because um, all too often we're told, you know, fewer stage directions the better, no, don't, don't, don't add stage directions. And I think that's a cliche that ought to be eliminated stage directions are sort of like love letters to the actors and also to the people reading the play and plays can be read you know not just seen so i found that the stage directions were very well characterized i, I really like this very much. yeah i know andy wants to chime in there but i just want to say on that note larry um as an actor and a director i i really enjoy stage directions because i feel like they they shed light on, on the intention that the playwright had. And in an absurdist play like Katrine's, they're invaluable. Like when we were reading the piece of Master and the Umbrella, it was really important to, to digest the notes um, that, that the playwright was giving us. Um, but I understand what you're saying, of course. Uh, I just always am kind of a devil's advocate, but I, um, yeah, I, I like your stage work. But Andy, please. Yeah. I really enjoyed this a lot. Thank you. Um, I haven't heard this this one. Um, actors were great. I couldn't believe you'd never seen these before. I mean, really so into it, um, seen the play before. Um, when someone asked Katrine to uh, to explain what it was about, I wrote her a private note, like, please don't, don't tell them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry, I missed that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's so great is when we did Peace of Master and the Umbrella, at one point, um, late, late in the rehearsal process, uh, someone said, what is this about? And, um, and it'll help us understand. One of them was about Facebook and about how you can share something and it gets twisted and um, digested in ways it was never intended. And then arguments happen on something that wasn't actually ever being said and, you know, they're that kind of monster that Facebook can be. Um, yeah. yeah, that's a metaphor. I mean, 
I don't even know, you know, whether Katrine, you would use the term absurdist, but um, I think in some ways that uh, term kind of limits us. Um, so sort of not knowing what it's about, to me, really expands the whole experience tremendously. And, um, you know, I mean, I can lay on, okay, different points of view and perspectives and the mountain is here, the shadow is there. We can try to force things into this or that. And I think it would be just a great thing to just, just have a discussion about. And there's this sort of uh, disquieting that I'm, I don't know if that's the right word, but that I really enjoy in Katrine's work um, that it just delights me. And I'm uh, in, in that, uh, there's a famous Robert Frost uh, story where he read, and he's sort of like a very understandable poet for most 20th century people. And someone said, could you explain the poem to us uh, you know, from, in the audience who's giving reading? And he said, sure, I'd be very happy to. And then he read the entire poem front to back again, said nothing else. And the guy in the audience said, uh, no, no, I, I, I was hoping you would explain the poem, not read it again. Oh, he's like, oh yeah, I understand. I'll, I'll explain it to you. And then he read the whole poem again. That was it. <laughs> Andy, are you also in the Bay Area? Uh, I'm about five and a half hours north now, but um, oh. I used to be, yes. Um, Can I say something? Um, in a way, Andy Couturier is responsible for everything. You're <laughs> 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 my writing teacher. And I took classes with him for 12 years. Um, I know him for 20 years, for the first 12 years. I was his student on and off, and it was just the best experience. He's the best. He's also an award-winning author, uh, among many other things. So amazing. This is about you, Katri, not about me. Thank you, but it's, it was your, <laughs> your play. <laughs> well, Andy, I ask for multiple reasons. Um, one of them is because you just referenced Robert Frost, and there are quite a number of poets who have been part of the collective perspective over time. And it's always our intention uh -huh. to have a night of, uh, of poetry. So, you know, if you would care to be involved in that. Um, do, you know, sure. do you know Joseph Aki? Nope, okay. I don't. So he's, he's a, a poet of note in the Bay Area. So um, worth looking up or okay. mo most Thank likely you. If, you decide yeah. to, if you decide to be involved in one of a poetry night, you would, you'll meet him. Sure. Sure. But Isaac, I, if you're the person who's coordinating, this is amazing. I've seen many different things happening in Zoom, dream groups, and I just think this is wonderful. And I just, you know, I didn't know how this would work. And it's, it seems like it's really working great. And, oh, uh, yeah. I only wish my acting career would afford me more time to do this. But it's to the point now where, like, this is the last podcast I could do for uh, quite a while. Um, but yeah, it's so rewarding. It's so rewarding to get mm. artists together. And because creativity inspires creativity. So anyway, cheers to all of you, but um, we should probably Bef move on. Yeah, before we leave, I just want to say that I had no idea what the next line was going to be, but the way she wrote it, it was so easy to fall into a natural conversation because it was written so well, the two characters were written so well that it didn't matter where you were going next because it was such a natural thing to say whatever you were in in the moment. So the next thing, it didn't matter where it was going to change to because it was written so well. And so, uh, yeah, the, it was written as a conversation and it didn't matter where it was going to bump off to next because if you stayed in the moment, uh, that's all that mattered. So written really well. I just wanted to say that. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Isaac. Yeah, that's the key to life, right? Stay in the moment. Stay in the moment, yeah. <laughs>